So uh, welcome to this discussion about the Open Relief Project. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, Shane Coughlin, uh, who's a long-term friend, who uh, is currently located in Japan and is one of the founders of the Open Relief Project. Welcome, Shane. Thanks very much, Simon. Thank you for this opportunity, and it's a pleasure to be here. So, Shane, tell us a little bit about, uh, first of all, what is Open Relief? Right. Well, Open Relief is a design project. It's intended to address some of the problems that we've encountered previously around disaster relief, most notably lessons learned in last year's Tohoku earthquake, where we had a severe problem managing to find out where people were and what they needed. Our frontline disaster relief technology, quite frankly, wasn't really up to the job, given the scale of the problem. We talked about this at LinuxCon Japan 2011, and it turned out that there's a whole bunch of really great infrastructure technology that we're building nowadays. But the frontline stuff, yet again, was not quite ready. So from there, we decided to design these technologies using as many off-the-shelf components as we could, using open hardware, using free and open source software, gluing things together, refining the technology and trying to make ways to slot into existing disaster relief to solve the problem of looking into a disaster zone, finding out what exactly was happening as fast as possible, and getting that data to responders. Right. In a nutshell, we built a robot airplane to do that. <laughs> so I, I, is your project purely about the robot airplane, or has it got a wider scope that's to do with data analysis and software to support relief activities? It, it certainly does. The most visible aspect of the project, if you come to us, is something like the robot aircraft technology. But this is actually a project to design sensors and platforms for quickly gathering and sharing information in disaster situations. So for example, the flying robot platform is a way to get sensors, to get cameras, into a disaster to gather information. We're also developing ground-based sensors. For example, we have a new type of radiation detector based on an ionization chamber. It's very low power, it's very simple, and on the ground it can act like a canary when something goes really wrong. We're going to build up a whole collection of sensors and information gathering platforms like the robot aircraft. These will be designed and tested and made freely available to everyone to build and implement for their own situation. So in other words, this is really a project to build lots of sensors, lots of platforms, by using as much pre-existing technology and as much open technology on top of that as possible. So it's really cheap and really simple. Our radiation detector is about $40 retail. So on supply chain, if you can get a company making it, it's gonna be much, much cheaper. The robot aircraft, we're aiming for $1,000. The one that we showed at LinuxCon Japan 2012, the whole retail bill of materials for that was $740. Right. So the, the, the aircraft seemed to appear very quickly because I, I remember what, seeing you start the project and then it seemed like the next day there was this aircraft already being sketched out. <laughs> was that based on a lot of uh, existing work or did that, was that just designed from scratch really quickly? Uh, there's. There's a whole bunch of pieces in there, and it's pretty complex technology, given that we're gluing together computers, we're gluing together optics, we're gluing together airframes. But the, the airframe, the most visible element, is off the shelf. That's actually a high-end RC airframe, which we sourced out of China. And that airframe allowed us to get started really quickly on prototyping and testing. And when it came to, for instance, putting all the components into the airframe so quickly, Behind that, there were many, many months of studying what was out there, what was used as in existing, let's say, high-end hobby kit or research, and what could we get our hands on at low price points. So you saw it come to life really quickly. We could prototype really quickly. Uh, I'd say, call it six months of research and two months of build. That's, that's not bad, but it wasn't overnight. It just looked like it because uh, you know it, it, it seemed to come from nowhere. So would you describe your project as an open hardware project or would you simply describe yourself in a different way? Right. Well, this is, is not an open hardware project and it's not a free and open source software project. This is a design project using 
open technologies. So generally, we try to use open technologies that everyone can use, study, share, and improve. Part of it is open hardware. Part of it is free and open source software. And part of it simply is design schematics. So regard it as a technology project which tries to make things as available to people as possible. But if you pushed me, in the end, I guess I'd have to say we're crowdsourcing. This is a social project. There's lots of different types of experts getting together because we're trying to address a specific issue regarding disaster relief. It's very hard to see what's going on. It's very hard to manage to get through the fog. We're cutting through the fog by using a multitude of technologies. But, but it isn't uh, one thing or the other. So you know, when you're describing that, would you say that you are, uh, the, is there some commercial dimension to what you're doing? Or is everything that yeah. you're doing um, a, a, a non-profit or a not-for-profit activity? Mm. Now that's a good question. There must be a commercial element to this to make sure that the technology is spread out. Open Relief is not. Open Relief is purely a design project. We have lots of different types of experts around the world sharing their technology, sharing their minds, sharing their time. The way we do that is by saying the Open Relief Project, that's where we're doing a donation towards disaster relief collectively. But we will try to build a community. I, I use the phrase ecosystem normally, um, though some people would object to that because it's inherently around business. Um, we're trying to build a community, and that community will contain developers, technical people, it will contain PR people, it will contain disaster relief experts, and it will contain businesses. There are companies making, for example, lightweight drones for the hobby market. What we're going to try and do is to talk with these companies and try to get them building compatible airframes, or exactly our airframe, and putting as much of the technology into it as we can because that can be repurposed for other uses, like, for example, general mapping, or simply having fun in a park. We're going to try and get commercial stakeholders. We are not commercial. We're a design project. Right. But we do want commercial stakeholders, and the technology can and will be commercialized in many spheres. Right. So um, tell me a little bit more about what you're designing here. Uh, you're right. designing schematics for hardware. You're des you're uh, assembling stacks of open source software to produce specific solutions? Uh, are you designing um, data formats and uh, data standards to use within those environments? Exactly what is this design project designing? Okay. Uh, from a technical perspective, mostly we're simply building on pre-existing technology. And whenever we can, we don't reinvent the wheel. So we have a software stack that's relatively big for things like computer vision. So the robot aircraft, it can recognize roads, people, and smoke. It can get up there. It can see things. It can tell you if they're still out there. We're hooking it into things like open street maps so that it'll be able to confirm that certain roads are still there, certain landmarks are still active. But our custom software is minimal. We're doing computer vision. That's on OpenCV. That's on Linux kernel. We're using various operating systems between the kernel level and the app level. So for example, we're using Debian in a test system. We're going to be testing with Ubuntu. We're going to be testing with Fedora. That stack, mostly off the shelf, mostly not custom. So we have a big software stack, but the custom element is tiny. It's just what it hasn't been made before. When it comes to hardware, we're taking the same approach. We have open hardware technologies for things like airplane autopilots. We're using those. We're keeping them off the shelf. Where we will make a change is in fuel consumption, because most hobby kits, they don't really care. They want to go fast. They want to have fun. We, we're going to use something a lot slower to save power, to save energy, so it'll go a lot further. So we'll do things like change the way that the autopilot uses power, change the way that it responds and turns, but it's just slowing it down a little. That change file, those custom changes, we'll make those available. But it'll be a very small contribution. Data formats. We have no intention of creating any new data formats because we want to fit into existing processes in a turnkey way. So we're looking at things like Sahana Eden, and that's a disaster management system used by the Red Cross. It was, it was created in the wake of the huge Asian, Asian tsunami about 10 years ago. You may recall that we had so many people killed in Southeast Asia. When the wave came across, it hit a lot of countries, and disaster management at that point was completely overwhelmed. 
So this platform, Sahana Eden, allows you to input your units. It allows you to understand damage. It allows you to do mapping. And you can input data into it in various spreadsheet formats and similar formats. We're going to take our data, make sure it's compatible with Eden and other similar disaster platforms, and input it into them. So we're just going to use pre-existing data formats. We're not going to create anything new at this stage. Right. Okay. So now you mentioned Sahana there. They're, they're uh, an OSI affiliate in the, uh, the new OSI affiliate scheme. Uh, yes. What, what, is, what are your relationships with other uh, organizations working in either open source software, open hardware, or um, relief activities? Right. Well, we're going to work with absolutely everyone we can. We're just limited in the amount of time we have. So when it comes to, say, Sahana, we're not actively talking with Sahana on inputs. We're simply reading their documentation and gearing up so that our data will go into Sahana. We're not at the stage where we have the manpower to go to all of the projects and build direct relationships. What we're concentrating on right now is trying to get in contact with some people who are on the front line. And we want to use them to refine our front line technology. On the back end, let's say disaster management technology, their requirements are very well known. They need accurate GIS data and they need very simple ways to input it. So we don't feel a great amount of requirement to individually approach those projects right now, given our limited resources. Our priority is talking to the frontline guys and saying, your experience, our current technology, what can we do better to make sure that it solves your problem? So yeah, we're going to talk with everyone. It'll just take a while. Um, um, where are you based? I know that you're in uh, Japan. Uh, I know that you've got some other folks involved in the project. Where right. are there groups of people who, who uh, people could get to know and get involved with? Right. Well, the project is actually quite large. It grew very quickly. So we've got people in the United States, in the United Kingdom. We've got people in uh, New Zealand and in Japan. And that's where our primary contributors are currently located. But now we've had some new people come up to us in the last few days. We've got uh, contributors coming on board in Taiwan. We've got contributors coming on board in Korea. Our website was translated an hour ago into Korean and will be put online shortly. Uh, we're going to be all over the place. We have about 26, 27 people on the project at the moment. Uh, that doubled in the last month because we started to become visible. And we expect to have quite, quite a lot of coverage. Uh, what I can say is that if you're interested in joining the project, as long as you can use English, we're very able to support you. And we have people on the ground in America, UK. We've got people on the ground in New Zealand. If you're interested in a different language, at the moment I'm afraid we're limited to Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. So, so if I did want to get involved, uh, what sort of uh, areas are there where I might be interested and where my uh, very limited and elderly skills might be useful to you? Well, we have a, a breadth of problems to solve, and that's the, the interesting point of the project, though also one of its challenges. You mentioned about, for instance, software stacks, and we're making a huge stack of technologies, hardware, software, and processes to manage it. So to give you an illustration of that, we need to train people on how to use these technologies. And these two technologies are new, and for many people, they're really weird. So to train people to do that, we've actually started using strategy simulation. You'll have heard of that before from, let's say, the military perspective as wargaming. So we've got a document which will be released relatively soon, which is a, a strategy simulation that takes you through disaster management and includes our technology as part of disaster response to teach people in a friendly way how to use it. We have, in other words, an enormous stack of approaches to disaster relief trying to insert this new technology into disaster relief processes that already exist, trying to provide training, trying to provide outreach, trying to provide the technology itself to test it and to refine it. We need everything from software technicians through to mathematicians through to PR people. So anyone can contribute to this project. We need anyone to do so. And the, the only proviso is, and this is the sad thing, the people who contribute to this project are doing something fundamentally brilliant, I believe. We are addressing a new problem. We're doing it in an exciting way, and a lot of energy is coming together. However, we don't have a free robot for everyone to play with. And most of us will not get to play with the toys that we're actually contributing to. That's the downside. 
The upside is that we've actually managed to build this technology in a few months. We're on a high speed run towards production ready in December and it looks like we're going to meet that with a comfortable margin. But yeah, we need everyone all types of skills and we need them as soon as possible. Uh, and do you need money as well or are you a project that uh, really favors uh, uh, donations of soul, spirit and hand rather than of cash? The primary activity of this project is people. So it's the crowdsourcing, it's the minds that we need. Uh, what we do need as well is a certain amount of technology. Our technicians do need it and there's two ways we can obtain that. One is through donations and the other way is through money. So we are setting up an association in the United Kingdom to accept uh, donations and we also accept hardware. We've actually already had hardware donations come in. So our radiation detector, as an example, is built with a nanode and that was donated to us by the nanode people. They gave us two of those very early on for prototyping. A Swiss company has just sent us uh, four Tegra 2 processors to try to run high-end computer graphics and see if we might be able to use those to speed up our visual recognition development. So we need hardware, we will accept donations, and we'll be launching an association in the UK to do that. Okay. But uh, primarily, we need people. Do, do you have a, a web page somewhere that lists what your vacancies and needs, and uh, you know, the, the Document Foundation has this web page called Easy Hacks, which is right. kind of the on-ramp for volunteers to come in and just tinker with something and discover that they, that they, they like what they're doing. You know, how do I get involved? Where do I go to find out how to get involved? What, what, where should I all go the data is found. All of the data is found at www.openrelief.org. So you should go there, first of all, and have a look. Openrelief.org is a simple site at the moment. So it's one page that basically says, here's what we're doing, here's our time scale, here's how to get involved, and here's what we need. It's a very simple page. We're going to expand on that a little bit and get more specific. So for instance, when we have a particular problem and we're really stuck, we're going to ask for specific skills to come on board. But right now, it's a broad call and it lets you know the general approach to how we're doing stuff so that you know roughly where you could fit in when you bring your skills to the table. Right. But we keep it very simple, very flat, very informal. We've learned off the Linux kernel, actually, to get this ball rolling. So from the look of the website, it looks like the best thing I can do this afternoon to join in is to join one of the mailing lists. Would you agree? Yeah, that would be great. And for instance, you have a great amount of experience in community development, community management. So my personal suggestion would be that unless you're desperately interested in how the developers are refining the airframe, go for the outreach list. And that's where we have the advocates and the PR people and where we're trying to work out how do we message this stuff? How do we explain it? How do we train people? So that's all the communication level. There's the developer list for all of the technical stuff. And then we have a user list, which is, uh, I'm new to this, what is it? <laughs> list. And I think we only have one person on the user list. Most people, <laughs> most people don't bother. They, they go straight into something else. Uh, well, it's been uh, fascinating to talk to you about it, Shane. Um, I'm very excited to see the project you're doing. I, I saw you, all your responses uh, on the social media during the earthquake, and I saw you were very moved by that, and I think this is a very practical uh, and, and uh, uh, useful response to it. I uh, wish you every success with it. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Simon. It's been a pleasure.